Well, welcome here to this conference, and I know you're off to a, a great start. It's a, it's a real honor for our church to host you and the seminary to invest in your life. Would you pray with me? Father, thank you for the delight we have of singing like this. Lyrics that are precious to the redeemed, the world would never understand. For your grace, for your greatness, for this creation which you have given us to remind us of how amazing and wonderful you are. Father, I know that church leaders have gathered here from around the country and from other countries, and you know the, the volume they bring in their heart to these sessions, the needs they have, the desires they have. And I pray, Father, that these sessions together will be a, a sweet time not only with each other, but with you, our great creator, God, our loving redeemer. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. In 1934, the veterans of foreign affairs put up a cross out in the Mojave Desert far enough from traffic. In fact, you wouldn't be able to see it unless you were hiking in that region. Cross stood only seven feet high on a stony outcrop called Sunset Rock. It was literally in the middle of nowhere. A park service employee sued the government demanding that this cross be removed and it entered years of court battles. Eventually, a court decided that it would be all right to leave standing if the arms of it were covered with a plywood box so that it looked like a billboard instead of a cross. Maybe that will do it. But it wasn't good enough. And for some reason, this lonely cross out in the remote portion of the Mojave Desert was so threatening to our national conscience that the American Humanist Society, the Civil Liberties Unions, Freedom From Religion Foundations, Americans United for Separation of Church and State, battled it. The case would be battled all the way to the Supreme Court. And just over nine years ago, it was agreed that it could stay. It wasn't really endorsing much anyway. But out there in that desert where almost no one saw it, that cross had to go. Today, secular and uh, liberal religious organizations together are claiming that the cross is a symbol of oppression and it needs to be taken down. It reminds me of the Apostle Paul who told us quite some time ago, that the preaching of the cross would be offensive. It would be a stumbling block. It would be considered foolishness. And frankly, the desire of our world is not just to remove the cross from culture, but our God. Revisionist history is busy erasing uh, any vestige of God from the fabric of our history. A few years ago, the new Capitol Visitor Center opened in Washington, D.C., costing $621 million. It was designed as sort of a stopping place. Tourists from around the world would come, and those who arrived would be, would be given information. Thousands of visitors every year who came to the Capitol complex. Before it opened, one believing senator took an early tour and noticed fairly quickly some interesting changes. 
One panel on a wall announced that America's national motto was, out of many, one. When, of course, our national motto established by Congress in 1956 is, in God we trust. Another display featured a replica of the speaker's rostrum emitting the words that are emblazoned in gold leaf behind her chair presently in the house chamber, which reads, In God We Trust. Another exhibit displayed the, the actual table used by Abraham Lincoln at his second inauguration upon which he placed his Bible. The table is there. The Bible is missing. One omission that struck me that shows how deeply uh, distressing our world is and desires to erase God from our history, there was a display of the copy of the Constitution. Well, you don't mess with the Constitution. However, the clause just before the signatures at the end, which read, done in convention by the unanimous consent of the states present, the 17th day of September in the year of our Lord, 1787. The new version had all of that, but omitted the words, in the year of our Lord. You just can't mention our Lord. You just can't mention God. Dostoevsky, of course, famously wrote, if there is no God, anything is permissible, right? And what has become permissible? I don't want to review what you're already reading and reiterating all the details, but we're certainly aware of the value of life, which is on a serious downgrade from the sale now of aborted baby parts to the marginalization of the elderly. At a recent bioethics conference, a professor of theology, no less, gave a lecture that said personhood should be determined by culture. I didn't say gender, I said personhood. She said, an Alzheimer's patient without any memory and without people who care for them ceases to be a person. Maybe wonder what would happen if she one day got Alzheimer's. What concerns me is not so much that the world is sliding toward the Roman Empire. We're not there yet. But the religious world is it's going along at the same pace. A few years ago, Rob Bell was interviewed by Oprah Winfrey, and, and he's come out with a recent book on marriage, and he quoted from that book. He said this, marriage, gay and straight, is a gift to the world because the world needs more, not less love. Oprah then asked him with quite a bit of passion, when is the church going to get that? And he responded, we're close. We're moments away. You know, as you envision your ministry, which for all of us, even when we selected the title vision for the theme, we had different ideas in mind, didn't we? As you envision ministry, What's happening, certainly, has ratcheted everything up. I, I think the pundits are saying this is sort of accelerated where we've been going as a culture at least a decade into the future. It might be new to us, but it isn't new to the scope of church history, certainly human history. I do agree with one of our country's leaders who wrote this 200 years ago. I tremble for my country when I reflect that God is just and that his justice cannot sleep forever. The question remains, what do you do? What do you do in a culture like ours? How do you respond to the shifting seismic changes in our world? How do you respond in a way that best serves the gospel and our chief shepherd and the church, in every generation, really, in one degree or another, the church has to answer this question. What do we do now? That's the way I like to put it. What do we do now? 
Dr. Gabeline, a scholar, Old Testament scholar, called it, quote, the burning question of our day. And he wrote that in 1939. It's the burning question of our day. It's the burning question of every day. In fact, it happens to be the question that was first put into inspired scripture by David. And I want you to know I'm preaching from a different text than I originally planned. But I want to take you there to Psalm chapter 11. Psalm 11. And everything I said so far is the introduction, so it doesn't count, so the clock starts now, all right? <laughs> That's how it works. Look at verse 3. Psalm 11, verse 3. If the foundations are destroyed, what can the righteous do? Now, you notice he doesn't ask, you know, what do you do when the roof leaks? He doesn't ask, what do you do when the door won't open or when some of the windows crack? No, what do you do when the very foundational structure upon which life around you is supported, what do you do when that starts going away? That's the burning question of the day. Now go back with me for just a moment or two to verse one where David sort of declares this opening statement of trust. Notice just the first phrase, in the Lord I take refuge. He doesn't write, I take refuge in my kingdom. I take refuge in my judicial system. I take refuge in my family. I take refuge in the temple. I take refuge in the Lord. It's as if he knew that he was in for a rough ride, and every believer is. In fact, someone who follows God is not guaranteed a smooth ride. We're guaranteed a safe arrival, but not a smooth ride. In the meantime, here's what it felt like to him. David wrote, notice, the latter part of verse 1. How can you say to my soul, flee like a bird to your mountain? Now, somebody here evidently is telling David that he's nothing more than a helpless little bird. He can't fight. He can't defend himself. All you can do Is, is fly away. Some unnamed counselor or counselors is telling David to run away and, and hide. And David reacts by saying, how can you tell me that? How can you tell my soul that my only option is to fly away? And it made me think over the course of church history, how many have looked around at their world and said, well, that's the solution, to fly away, maybe to a monastery? to some sideline, maybe to some cottage, you know, on a lake where I can get away from the rat race. Never mind the needs of the community and, and, and the mission of the church. I'm going to fly away to some safe place where I can just leave it all. A woman came up to me, in fact, about a year ago. This is before COVID, and she said society was getting so wicked. She said friends of hers had decided to buy land and build a commune for Christians. And they were pressing her to buy in. And she wanted to know if I thought it'd be a good idea. Well, in a sentence, I told her that our mission isn't to escape the world. It is to engage the world as preserving salt in a decaying culture, as shining light in a darkened culture. But I don't want to minimize, by the way, the, the, the trouble or the danger. Let's not just, you know, um, smile and move past this. Look at, look at verse 2. For behold, these advisors are informing David now. For behold, look, the wicked bend the bow. They have fitted their arrow to the string to shoot in the dark at the upright in heart. You notice here that David's enemies have him in their sights and it's in the dark. The Septuagint translates it in a moonless night, which is another way of saying, David, you're a sitting duck. You don't know where they are. They can see you. You don't have a chance. 
And the advisors, by the way, are using verb tenses that ratchet up the tension. You could translate it, they are already bending the bow. They have already placed the arrow upon the string. They are, are already taking aim. It's just a matter of a second and you're dead. You can almost hear the firing squad saying, ready, aim. David, there's no hope. I saw a cartoon once where two men are pictured. They're friends. It doesn't say anything about them. Just the fact that their backs are against the wall facing a firing squad. Their hands are chained. Their legs are chained. They're blindfolded. All the soldiers about 10 feet away have their rifles up. And the shout is given, ready, aim. One man looks to his friend and says, don't worry, I have a plan. There's no time for a plan. This is David. This is the picture he's painting. It's as if it's already ready, aim. You'd better fly away. The only chance you've got is to sprout wings and head to the mountain. Otherwise, you're dead. And then with that, he asks the question, of the ages. If the foundations are destroyed, what can the righteous do? The word he uses here for foundations means the settled order of things. David is sort of likening society to a building. The foundations of society, law, order, truth, morality, justice, integrity, you fill in the blank. When those foundational principles are crumbling away, what do you do? Now with that, David gives us an inspired answer. And the answer really is, and it struck me in a word, vision. Not, not of culture, uh, not of uh, a worship system, so to speak, which we would translate into the culture of the church, not the world around you, but a vision of God, as if to say it's not so much what you're going to do, but where you're going to look. And he gives us four ways to correctly view God. Let's go through them. First, we need a vision of God as entirely undisturbed in his sovereignty. A vision of God as entirely undisturbed in his sovereignty. Verse 4 begins, The Lord is in his holy temple. The Lord's throne is in heaven. Now that might not sound all that encouraging, frankly. The foundations are being destroyed on earth and God is far away in heaven. David isn't making a statement that implies God is somehow distant. He isn't telling us that God is removed. David is wanting us to sing about the fact that God rules. In fact, David has given this to his choir master, and he wants that individual to turn it into music because he wants his nation to be able to sing this answer. And it's basically that God rules. The reference to God's throne being in heaven is not a reference to his inactivity. It's a reference to his supremacy. And when you're living in a society or even in some personal circumstance where it seems like everything is falling apart, steadfastness has everything to do with concentration. What are you going to concentrate on? The crumbling foundations? Is that the focus of our concentration? One conspiracy after another. One disaster after another. One disease after another. One nail-biting election after another. Really? If you do that, the sky will be perpetually falling, as it were. David is concentrating on the granite foundation underneath him of this undisturbed sovereign. God's throne is never unsettled. He will never be unseated. And he'll never run for election either. 
Secondly, we need a vision of God as entirely aware of his creation. Notice the last part of verse 4. His eyes see or behold, his eyelids test the children of man. The Lord tests the righteous and the wicked. In other words, when the foundations are crumbling, God sees. He sees. He knows. God sees David's attackers. Old Testament scholars, by the way, cannot place the context of this psalm. They don't know if this is Absalom. They don't know if this is Saul. They don't, they don't know what it is, which I think is great because we can apply it to all our lives. But God sees. God sees David's attackers gathering in that moonless night because God can see in the dark. And this reference here to his eyelids, his eyelids test, is a reference to squinting. It's an idiom that refers to what I do. When I want to look at something closely, I will raise my head. Why? Because I'm going to look through the bottom of my bifocals. In fact, it's so bad now that even when I'm not wearing my glasses, I raise my head when I look at something as if that's going to help. That's the idea of squinting. That's the idea of looking carefully and closely. The idea of eyelids in the Hebrew text is that idea. David is essentially saying, God is squinting at them. He's carefully looking. He's not missing anything. And God happens to be an eyewitness to everything. And David writes here that God examines both righteous and unrighteous. You notice this. Those rightly related to him and those who defy him. This is terrifying news for the unbeliever who will one day stand before God at the great white throne judgment and come to the horrifying discovery that God had been an eyewitness of every thought, every motive, every intention, and every, every deed. But to the believer, whose every sinful deed and thought and intention and motive has already been judged by God through Christ, everything we go through life is scrutinized yet atoned for, which means all that's left is that which is profitable for which he's careful not to miss any of it so that he will one day reward you. Wow. What do you do when the foundations are crumbling? Well, get a fresh vision of God who is entirely undisturbed in his sovereignty, is entirely aware of his creation. Thirdly, who is entirely terrifying in his wrath. Notice the last part of of verse 5. Well, let's start at the beginning. The Lord tests the righteous, but his soul hates the wicked and the one who loves violence. This doesn't fit in very well within the typical evangelistic program, telling everybody that, you know, God loves everybody and doesn't have a problem with anybody. The balance of Scripture informs us that There is the love of God for sinners and the just hatred of God for sinners. Those are part of his attributes, a portion of them. They're attributes we may not hear very much. We'll hear more of his love than his anger. What our culture needs, you would probably agree with me, is is a great awakening, right? Well, think about the sermon that Jonathan Edwards preached that was part of the fabric of that awakening. Sinners in the hands of an angry God. Uh, Today, I think the sermon would be titled, People Who Make Bad Choices in the Hands of a Loving God. The church needs to stop as it were sweeping under the rug the terrifying truth that the unbelieving world is going to be the eternal object of God's anger and holy wrath. They're in deep trouble. God is angry. 
In fact, Paul says to the Roman church, he's storing up his wrath. It's just mounting up and it will be unleashed. Now there's a difference between God's anger and man's anger. God's wrath and man's wrath. So let me park here for a moment. They're worlds apart. There are two primary words in the New Testament that sort of expand our theological understanding of God's anger. One word is thumos, which gives us our word thermos, uh, thermometer. Paul never uses it when he refers to the anger of God, and he does so 10 different times in the book of Romans. The word thumos refers to an uncontrolled anger. It refers to what we would call road rage. It refers to that explosive moment of rage, that, that uncontrolled explosion of foolish anger, where you have to very quickly say, I'm sorry. At least that's the plan. I can remember a moment of thumos in my childhood. I was around 10 years of age. I was playing with a kid in his backyard. He was older than I was, bigger, stronger. I don't remember what he was doing to make me angry, but whatever he was doing was not provoking me unto love and good works. I do remember that much. And I remember taking all I could from him and then suddenly punching him square in the nose, which meant I had to reach up. Next thing I know, he's holding a bloody nose. And there was that split second moment where I thought, I'm in deep trouble. And I began to run. I ran for my life, really. And he was right behind me, saying all sorts of unspiritual things. <laughs> I could tell he wasn't quoting any of his Awana verses as he chased me across that yard. At the edge of the yard is this, char uh, this chain link fence about four and a half feet high. I cleared it. I didn't even touch it. And he kind of ran into it, stumbled into it, huffed and puffed over it. And by then, I was long gone and able to grow up and preach to you tonight. <laughs> That's thumas. That's uncontrolled fit of anger. The word used for the anger of God is most often orge, which means a settled conviction. Wow. A settled conviction. One theologian wrote, a hundred years ago, God's anger is born of holy revulsion for that which is a contradiction to his perfect holiness. Other Psalms, I did a little searching, record this terrifying fact, Psalm 90. Who understands the power of your anger and your fury according to the fear that is due you? They do not fear God. He is furious with a settled conviction. Psalm 76. Who may stand in your presence when you are angry? I don't think that's on anybody's coffee mug. David's song here in Psalm 11 is indirectly reminding the believer, by the way, of not only who God is, but the fact that no matter how bad life gets, when the foundations are being destroyed, it will never be as bad as it will be for those upon whom God will one day pour his wrath. Notice he adds here in verse 6, let him rain coals on the wicked, fire and sulfur and a scorching wind shall be the portion of their cup. This is what Jesus will use in the New Testament to describe hell. This is their future. Which then affects our response. If God is angry in his settled uh, conviction, if, if God in his fury is withholding, it's unleashing, 
that gives us the ability to fairly easily pity the world. To beg it to be reconciled to God, as Paul did. To not get angry in response, knowing as bad as it might be for you or for me or for our brothers and sisters who are truly suffering in other parts of the world, it will never be as bad as it will be for them, those who choose not to fear God. Spurgeon once challenged his congregation that no one should die and go to hell without our arms wrapped around their knees. The song becomes a reminder that all you and I will ever suffer in this brief lifetime is nothing compared to the suffering of an eternal hell fueled by what? Fueled by the holy wrath of God. We need a vision of the true and living God who is entirely undisturbed in his sovereignty, entirely aware of his creation, entirely terrifying in his wrath. One more. He is entirely delighted in his beloved. Verse 7. For the Lord is righteous. He loves righteousness, righteous deeds. The upright will behold his face. I'm glad David doesn't say that the perfect will behold his face, but the upright, those who are right with God through the redemption of his son. We who have been clothed in the righteousness of Christ are now the objects of his love and his desire. Notice David emphasizes that we're actually going to see his face. That's the expression that, that leads us to understand we're going to have the closest communion possible face to face. Paul writes that when Christ, who is our life, appears, we also will appear with him in glory, in the glory of his being. We have no idea of how glorious that will be. Right now, it might be a moonless night, Present circumstances might be dark and darker, but the future is magnificently bright. And so the song effectively closes by saying one day we will no longer be looking to him, we will be looking at him face to face. And his delight in us, staggering thought, his delight in us observing his face, his delight in bringing us into his presence so that we can commune in that closeness, his delight in you, in you, his redeemed, his delight in you. At that moment, we'll settle every doubt and discouragement. It'll answer every delay and disappointment. It'll heal every wound. So when the, when the foundations crumble, it isn't so much what you do or what you say, but where you look. So let's look with fresh vision to this one who is entirely undisturbed in his sovereignty, entirely aware of his creation, entirely terrifying in his wrath, and entirely delighted in his beloved. Stand with me. Pray with me and then we'll sing and be dismissed. Spirit of God, we ask that you continue to shape our perspective. And I pray for every church leader, family member, as we sift through 
our reactions and our intentions. Thank you for your word and reminding us through David who suffered this moment in his life that you are sovereign and, and you're ruling and though everything around us might seem unsettled, you are eternally settled. I pray, Father, that these hours of sessions and conversations and books that are being read and prayer time that will be enjoyed will just refresh our hearts in your glory in a vision of you that is correct and we'll thank you in Jesus name